in the heart of California's rugged Sierra Nevada sits Yosemite National Park. From soaring cliffs and giant waterfalls to enormous trees and tranquil meadows, Yosemite is a landscape of diversity. The park is the destination for millions of visitors each year. And with some of the finest scenery in the world, it's easy to understand why. Humans are dwarfed by a scale and power that can only be found in the natural world. Trees that live for thousands of years, waterfalls that pour hundreds of feet, and granite walls that climb unbroken for more than a half mile. In Yosemite, these features have combined to create a landscape like no other. At over 1,000 square miles, an entire lifetime could be spent exploring Yosemite National Park. Yosemite is well recognized for its massive granite cliffs and domes. The park is home to Yosemite Falls, the tallest waterfall in North America at 739 meters. In 2015, the park celebrated its 125th anniversary. As a climber, you feel like you're at home. People from all over the world, you could feel it. The excitement and the psych for that place. 90 million year old granite, El Capitan. The Leaning Tower, Half Dome, Sentinel. What more could you ask for? Happy birthday, Yosemite. So glad you were born. Hey, Yosemite, happy birthday. Happy 125 in the Harding slot on Astro Man. Whew, it's tight in here. Hey, Yosemite, I just wanted to wish you a happy 125th birthday. Yeah, I just wanted to say happy birthday to Yosemite. Despite the fact that you have nearly killed me on multiple occasions, ah! I still cherish my time there and just crave your presence. The Yosemite Grant was the first time in all of human history that a large tract of wild land was set aside not for the exclusive use of the rich or royalty of a nation, but for everyone and for all time. When that bill was passed and signed by President Abraham Lincoln, we were in the midst, the depths, the worst year of the American Civil War where casualties numbering 2,000 a day were coming back to Washington, D.C. And the same day that Lincoln signed into law the act of setting aside Yosemite, he also signed into law an increase in the income tax to help pay for the war that he hoped would save his country. In the 19th century, up until the Yosemite Grant, the business of Congress was to dispose of public land through homesteads, for miners, for lumbermen, for the railroads. And something about this place made us stop. Say, at least here, let's do something different. And it's all about this great idea, an idea that when it was first proclaimed was as radical and unique as the Declaration of Independence, which was to say that a nation's most majestic and special and some would say sacred places should be a set aside not for the rich and for royalty and the well-connected, but for everyone and for all time. And when that was first applied here to Yosemite, that was a historic moment. Beginning in the high mountains, the Merced River tumbles dramatically into Yosemite Valley. While on the valley floor, it winds its way through meadows and forest. The exceptional scenery known throughout the world helped inspire the very idea of national parks. To many visitors, Yosemite Valley is the heart of Yosemite National Park. People have always just been attracted to waterfalls all around the world. And I think it's because it's not all that often that you see water just pitching through space. When people think of waterfalls, especially here in Yosemite Valley, which has uh, a very high concentration of high waterfalls, they tend to think of facts. They tend to think of Ribbon Fall, uh, the highest single drop of water in North America, around 1,600 feet. They tend to think of Yosemite Falls, 
you know, 2,425 feet, fifth highest waterfalls in the world. But the numbers don't add up to the beauty of those falls. Every fall has its own unique character. Every fall is water saying to the world, look, I can be different over here than I was over there. They have their own personality. There's a lot of different waterfalls in this area. It depends on the time of the year you come here. The ones that are going right now would include Vernal Falls, Nevada Falls on the Merced River, Bridal Veil Falls on Bridal Veil Creek, um, and some other smaller ones. But this one's named Yosemite Falls. It's the falls. Well, I think it was given the name Yosemite Falls because it's the premier waterfall in Yosemite Valley. Bridal Veil is a spectacular waterfall, so are Nevada Falls and Vernal Falls, but they're quite a bit smaller. Yosemite Falls is just right there. I mean, when you kind of turn the corner and, and you get your first view of it, it's amazing. People tend to want to get as close as they can to the edges of waterfalls. I guess to experience that rush, that energy of the water uh, going from a placid little stream to a, a raging, free-falling torrent. People are drawn to waterfalls, and sometimes it's hard to know where that limit is as far as how close you are drawn to it. If you could imagine being a drop of water in Yosemite Creek, what would you go through before you got to that? Well, first of all, you would be melted snow, maybe around the Mount Hoffman, Tuolumne Meadows area. There are a lot of small little lakes there. There's snow and ice that persists well into the summer in most years. And the melting snow and ice is basically what feeds Yosemite Creek. Yosemite Creek is, you know, it's flowing pretty quickly, but it's not a big creek. It's not a lot of big waterfalls, really, and pretty average forested terrain that it's flowing through. And then it kind of turns the corner there and starts heading for Yosemite Valley. And, and what I always think is neat about Yosemite Creek is that as it's flowing along gently through, through that canyon, it has no idea what's ahead of it. You know, it has no idea what it's about to do, which is suddenly and very abruptly reach the rim of Yosemite Valley and pitch off into a waterfall that's nearly 2,500 feet long. The beginning section is the most dramatic because that's where you're seeing it fall 1,400 feet from the rim down to that middle gorge. Once you're in that middle section, the part that I find very interesting is that it disappears. You know it's in there, but you can't really quite clearly see it. So even though that's probably the most photographed waterfalls in North America, there's a section of it that's sort of hidden from view, where it's kind of cutting into a little, into the rock. And then it comes out again at you at the lower Yosemite Fall and falls about another 300 feet. And we see that. So we see that lower stretch of 300 feet. We see that upper stretch of 1,400 feet, but there's 600 feet of mystery in there. But at just seven square miles, the valley is only one part of a much bigger place. High above the valley floor, Glacier Point sits on the south rim of Yosemite Valley. The Glacier Point Road winds its way through stunning mountain scenery, and a short walk provides a bird's eye view of Yosemite Valley, thousands of feet below. To the east lies Half Dome and Tenaya Canyon, while beyond the valley, Vast forests dominate the Yosemite landscape. It is interesting. People think of Yosemite, they think of Yosemite Valley, and that's understandable given how spectacular it is. And they don't realize that 95% of the park is wilderness, designated wilderness, and that this huge area extends back from the rims of the valley that is really quite wild. It, it amazes people to learn that the walls of the valley themselves are designated wilderness that the wilderness boundary is just 200 vertical feet above the floor of the valley. Especially in our society and in, in our culture, there's this drive to be successful and to always be going and always be doing. I think this is an opportunity for them to just take a deep breath. It's like a breath. It's like noticing your surroundings for the first time, you know, can be a, a big thing for someone. I think when you're in a day-to-day -day life in a city, and things become routine, you know, and sometimes I think things are taken for granted. 
I think it's just this soul connection with nature to try to remember. You know, we get so lost in our little human worlds and you get to come out here and just forget about it all and remember there's other things to life, you know. When you're back at home in a nice controlled environment, those are the things you talk about too. It's like the things you glorify afterwards, like all the bugs and the blisters and it's almost this idea of like you made it. You, you can do it, you know, you're out there in wilderness and this is what I endured and, and it was fun. Yeah, in retrospect. <laughs> Within Yosemite, some of these trees are the largest and tallest of their kind. But in three distinct groves stand the towering giant sequoias, the biggest trees in the world. At the southwestern corner of the park lies the largest and most accessible, the Mariposa Grove. This is home to some of the largest trees on earth, and to be among these giants is a humbling experience. These big trees inspired protection of Yosemite nearly 150 years ago, and they still inspire visitors today. The Mariposa Grove is one of the finest forests in the world, and a visit here is an important part of the Yosemite experience. While the western slopes are covered with ancient forests, the high peaks on the east side of Yosemite present a very different landscape. If you explore the crest of the Sierra Nevada or look at a map of these mountains, you will see that there are high plateaus scattered throughout the range. In Yosemite, at places like Mount Excelsior, Kuna Crest, Parsons Peak, we find these high flat plateaus up at elevations around 12,000 feet. Right along the crest, you had these plateaus that stuck out above the glaciers. And so actually the glaciers were carving around them. So they've ended up being kind of these isolated islands where we find unusual plant species that don't occur anywhere else. drive up the Tioga Road and you look up at the peaks around you, you see where the forest ends and then it looks like all rock and ice. But if you take the trouble to get up onto that rocky summit, in between the rocks is just the most incredible rock garden of wildflowers of every color, of every shape. The plants are very short. They might only be a few inches in diameter, but most of them will count their lives in decades and the, some of the larger ones very likely count their lives in centuries. The diversity and the variety and the sheer aesthetic beauty of it is, is just overwhelming. Most of the national parks in the United States were founded on their geology. Yellowstone displays volcanic features. The Grand Canyon shows millions of years of sedimentary history. And here in Yosemite, the geologic story is primarily one of granite. Granite is what's known as 
an igneous rock, which means it's born of fire. It cooled and solidified from magma or molten rock. And when magma erupts on the surface, we think of it as lava. Um, basically, granite started off as something similar to that. It was red hot, fluid rock. But instead of making it up to the surface and erupting as lava in a volcano, it stayed many miles below the surface and cooled there very slowly over thousands of years. And because it cooled so slowly, it allowed very large crystals to form. It's a very coarse-grained rock, and that's the key to its strength. This rock spent a long time at high temperatures, cooled very slowly, and that allowed a lot of the cracks to be annealed out of it, making a very strong rock. So the glaciers had a hard time moving it, and that's what allows you to carve the kind of landscape that you can see over my shoulder here. Granite is among the toughest rocks on the planet. I mean, it's very, very strong stuff. So when glaciers were moving through here, they certainly were able to erode and sculpt the landscape some. But a lot of the domes, the smooth ridges that we see up here in the high country, they're really a testament to the fact that glaciers weren't able to do a lot of eroding of this landscape. One of the things that makes Yosemite such a great place for us as geologists to work is that nature has taken these rocks and polished them for us. And so we can come out here and literally crawl around on our hands and knees looking at beautifully polished specimens that in places are polished almost as well as a commercial company would polish up your kitchen countertops for you. So we can see the relationships among these minerals. We can see into the guts of what was a magma chamber and see what was going on then frozen in time for us. Every visitor to Yosemite, I think, experiences granite in some way. I mean, you can't hardly not experience granite in a park like this where most of what you see is granite. And that can range from just taking a quick stroll off the side of the road to a place like Olmsted Point, to taking the hike up Half Dome, up to the summit, to spending four or five days climbing up El Capitan. I think more than most visitors, rock climbers have a really good sense for granite. Climbers take advantage of lots of the geologic features of the granite, such as these feldspar knobs that stick out, such as the occasional cracks, such as some of the dark blobs of different kind of rock in the granite that weather out that you can use for handholds or footholds. North of Yosemite Valley, the Tioga Road winds through a wonderland of rock on its way to Tuolumne Meadows and the Yosemite High Country. Along the way, the road passes Olmsted Point, where visitors enjoy an interesting view of Half Dome. Around the corner lies Tanaya Lake, one of the largest and most accessible lakes in Yosemite, and the perfect place to spend a summer afternoon. Over the hill from Tanaya Lake sits Tuolumne Meadows. Like Yosemite Valley, this land was sculpted by glaciers. But instead of a deep canyon, the moving ice formed sharp peaks and rounded domes. The wide open scenery of Tuolumne Meadows is very different from other areas of the park. And many of the plants and animals found here are unlike those at lower elevations. Tuolumne Meadows is a gateway to the Yosemite wilderness, and there are dozens of trails that lead into the mountains. While some will enjoy short walks that may last only an hour, others will begin hikes that can take days or weeks. A permit is required for overnight visits, and backpackers must carry many pounds of food and equipment. But for those that are willing and able, 
Nothing can compare to spending time in these mountains. In this alpine wonderland, nature has been reduced to the elemental rock and ice, sky and water. This is Yosemite at its most basic, and a visit here offers the chance for solitude and inspiration, as well as excitement and adventure. It's not surprising that meadows are this well of life in Yosemite because this is where water comes together. This is where life comes together. I love watching those meadows burst into life. And it's like the epicenter of life in spring in Yosemite. So bears using it for food, deer using it for food, frogs using it as a breeding ground, dragonflies, butterflies. I can't imagine all the things that would be missing if we didn't have these meadows. Meadows play a critical role in the landscape of Yosemite. They're biodiversity hotspots. There's quite a few plants and animals that really rely on meadows for important habitat, for shelter, for breeding grounds, for food source. In Yosemite, there are over 3,000 meadows, but that only represents 3% of the park. You know, even though that's such a small percentage of the park, meadows are a very important part of of the ecosystems in Yosemite, and they hold a great amount of ecological diversity of plants and animal species. Meadows are important for biodiversity, but they're also important for people, too. Most visitors to Yosemite will spend their time in or near meadows to see wildflowers, to listen to bird song or to enjoy open views of the surrounding landscape. So this human connection to meadows isn't new. People have been coming to Yosemite meadows for a long time. Meadows are places where people have lived and gathered for thousands of years. People have been here. I grew up here, my family is from here, and I have a special love for this place because this is where my ancestors are from and I want to help protect it. When European American settlers first arrived to Yosemite Valley in the 1850s, they displaced the native people there and really changed the way that meadows were managed. The gold rush brought a lot of European settlers. They had different ideas about fires. They stopped fires in the 1880s, and over time, it changed our meadows. Our meadows were encroached by conifers, and we are seeing the result of that today. Over the past 150 years, we've lost two-thirds of our meadow extent in Yosemite Valley due to fire suppression and hydrologic changes such as ditching and filling of meadows. Ditching of meadows, which was often done for mosquito abatement, but also to dry out meadows to allow seeding and haying for livestock grazing. When you look at a meadow in Yosemite Valley, like Cook's Meadow, for example, you probably wouldn't imagine that there were pigs and cows all over that meadow, but at one time there were. Yeah. 
What we realize today is that the past alterations that we've made to Yosemite Valley can be undone through better management and also active ecological restoration. After you take out all the infrastructure and the gravel, the infill, it comes back quickly and parking lots become meadows again, very wet meadows sometimes, and it's really beautiful to see native habitats return. Here 100 years later, we are restoring these places. We're bringing back the hydrology. We're bringing back the native plants. And then that brings back butterflies and dragonflies and bear and deer. This place can once again be the well of life that it initially was. We're able to accomplish all this fantastic meadow work in Yosemite through the help of the Yosemite Conservancy. In the past years, Yosemite Conservancy has donated millions of dollars to help restore meadows in Yosemite. They've also helped us improve visitor experience. They've helped us install boardwalks, fencing, and even interpretive signage to help us tell the story of why meadows are so remarkable. Visitors can help protect meadows by staying on established trails and respecting the wildlife by keeping a safe distance. It's such a privilege and honor to be able to help restore these meadows and native plants. Meadows are special, special places. The more time you spend exploring Yosemite National Park, the more likely you are to experience change in Yosemite. By the new year, the mountains are blanketed in white and the park is transformed into a winter wonderland. As temperatures drop, waterfalls can become ice falls. Usually, winter is a quiet time in Yosemite. season is definitely winter and the key to having winter be fun in Yosemite is to get out I think on skis and get out and explore it's a great way to get out and get some exercise you can get to all kinds of really cool places it's like the winter equivalent of going for a walk except more fun because you get to slide around when the landscapes covered in snow it opens up a lot of terrain to backcountry traveling in the summertime, we get used to hiking trails because that's often the path of least resistance. But once it gets buried in snow, you don't need a trail. You can travel over just about any terrain. Start skiing, you don't see that many people. It's amazing to get someplace like this on skis. You're in the city, you're in your life, you're at your jobs, you're with your kids. It's like, you know, you need to break away and drive and be on skis. You're like, oh God, a million excuses why I can't do it. And then you do it and then you turn around the corner and you get this view, it's unbelievable. Never say no, you gotta come out and experience it.
different skis and you start going down a hill and the speed increases and the excitement increases along with that. And it's kind of winter bliss where you go fast and far in a short period of time, standing on your feet, sliding down a hill. You can do it at whatever level you want to do it at. You know, you can go out on striding skis, and that's like kind of going for a walk. Or you can go out on skate skis, which is more like going for a run. There is nothing that will make me ever feel more alive than putting skis on. I feel freedom. I feel this intense adrenaline rush. You are able to just be out in nature, slowly taking it in, whether you're going uphill or downhill. There's an old ski area in Yosemite, California's first ski resort. Well, there was a lot of ski areas in national parks back in the 20s and 30s when people were really trying to draw people to these national parks in the wintertime. So places like Rocky Mountain National Park, Olympic National Park, Mount Rainier, Yosemite, Sequoia, they all brought in alpine ski areas to draw people to the national parks in the wintertime. Most people don't know about these ski areas because most of them are gone. The only ones left are Hurricane Ridge and Olympic National Park and Badger Pass here in Yosemite. Badger Pass is not a huge ski resort. It's more of a family-oriented ski area. It's not huge, it's not steep, it's so family-friendly. You don't have to worry about your kids skiing off the edge of a cliff. I'll come to Badger Pass, I'll ride the chairlifts, I'll practice my telemark skiing, and then I'll just keep going off trail and I'll go into the backcountry and I'll go into the wilderness do some backcountry ski touring. From Badger Pass, you can strike out into the backcountry out to Ostrander Hut, which was built by the CCC in the 1930s and still accommodating backcountry skiers today. Skiing around Ostrander has a lot of variations in terrain. There's open bowls that people can make beautiful turns down. There's excellent views from the top of steep ridge lines that you can look out to Half Dome and the Sierra Crest. The Ostrander Hut is this really great backcountry ski hut experience. It's run by the Yosemite Conservancy, so you can make a reservation for the hut through their organization. And one of the things that's really cool is that there's a hut keeper that's out there that really knows the trails and the terrain. You feel like you're going back in time. The style of the building wonderful stacked and mortared stone. It feels like a castle back in the mountains, miniature castle for skiers. The tales of skiing the backcountry that are spun around the fire at night, the playing of the cards, the cooking of the food, all of that happening in a winter environment in a backcountry stone ski hut is just not something you can get very many places. There's a trailhead that leads you out to Glacier Point. It's a groomed, cross-country ski trail on the Glacier Point Road. So in the summertime, it's a paved road that you can drive out to. And in the wintertime, it turns into this remarkable groomed trail that is groomed for both skate skiers and classic skiers to be able to go 11 miles out to Glacier Point. Epic views along the way, beautiful mountain scenes. And at the end, you are rewarded with a remarkable view of Half Dome. It is never disappointing. The hut out there is fully staffed, and you can get your meals, you can get your bunks out there, and, and just have an incredible time. A place like Ostrander, you're going to pack in all of your own gear. A place like the Glacier Point Hut, you can pay for that experience and have it catered for you. So depending on the level of adventure you're looking for, you can find it at either place. There's something about getting there under your own power you know, as opposed to driving out to Glacier Point, to actually take that trek, that 10, 11 mile trek on your own power and get out there on skis and then have it virtually all to yourself. It's a magical, quiet, peaceful experience that you just can't find during the rest of the year. And winter offers those types of experiences throughout Yosemite. It's peaceful. I mean, it's always peaceful here, but something with snow, and stars and moon and the rock, it's quiet. You could hear the waterfall yesterday. 
It's special. that you can be on snow in whatever capacity, it's magical. And the memories that you'll take back from Yosemite will far exceed your expectation. As temperatures rise, the snow begins to melt and quiet waterfalls are brought back to life. By early summer, the sound of water thunders throughout the park. These high flows may last for months, but by summer's end, the rivers have calmed. Some creeks and streams will stop running completely, and even Yosemite Falls can run dry. Exploring a landscape as dynamic as Yosemite National Park is very rewarding, but the natural forces that make the park so compelling can also present some very real dangers. Water is one of Yosemite's biggest attractions. Generated from melting snow, the water here is cold and swift, especially in the springtime. Visitors must respect all warning signs and realize that wet rocks along streams and rivers can be very slick. Do not go beyond fences or railings and never swim in swift water or above waterfalls. Even with all this water, it's important to remember that Yosemite can also be hot and dry. Protect yourself from the sun, which is more intense at higher elevations, and carry and drink plenty of water. Know your limits, and always keep safety in mind as you experience your Yosemite. The mission of the National Park Service is to protect the park for future generations while providing enjoyment to today's visitors. This protection makes Yosemite a great place to see diverse wildlife in its native habitat. To further protect wildlife and yourself, do not feed or approach any animal. For the protection of black bears, visitors are required to store all food, garbage, and scented items properly. Protecting wildlife also means driving with care. Hundreds of animals, from squirrels to bears, are struck and killed by cars each year. Mountain roads are often narrow and winding, and driving conditions can change rapidly. In the winter, snow and ice can make driving difficult, and four-wheel drive and chain restrictions are often in effect. In the summer, traffic and congestion, especially in Yosemite Valley, can bring cars to a standstill. If you park your car, you'll find that there are many other ways to experience Yosemite National Park. In the valley, the easiest way to get around is on the Yosemite Shuttle. These free buses run throughout the day and they stop at nearly every point of interest in Yosemite Valley. In addition to buses, bicycles are a great way to explore Yosemite. Miles of bike paths wind through the valley and rental bikes are available throughout the summer. For those who are looking for more activity, Yosemite is a hiker's paradise. In the valley, a short trail leads to the base of Yosemite Falls, while the popular Mist Trail follows the Merced River up to spectacular Vernal and Nevada Falls. In Tuolumne Meadows, mountain peaks and alpine lakes are all within a day's walk, while in Mariposa Grove, many will visit the Grizzly Giant, one of the largest trees in Yosemite. Throughout the park, hundreds of miles of trails await your discovery. Hi, I'm Vicki Mates, and I'm a park ranger here in Yosemite. Today I'd like to talk with you about one of Yosemite's most famous hikes, Half Dome. 
Now, Half Dome is one of the most striking features on the Yosemite landscape. It's not only inspired adventuresome spirits to climb it and to hike it, but also geologists to study it and artists to capture its unique beauty on canvas and on film. Hiking this Yosemite icon is an extraordinary accomplishment and it can create a memory of a lifetime. But Half Dome is an extremely challenging hike and it can be dangerous. You must be prepared in order to have a safe and enjoyable hike. The Half Dome hike is one of the longest and steepest day hikes that you're likely to encounter in a national park. It's a 14 mile round trip and gains nearly 5,000 feet in elevation. This is more than double the distance and elevation gain as most difficult hikes in Yosemite. Plus, it requires a mountaineering component at the end, climbing the cables. If you have an intense fear of heights, the cables will present a great challenge to you. Keep in mind that most people need 12 hours to hike to the top of Half Dome and back before dark. So start this hike at dawn or just before. Here's what to expect along this trail. The hike begins along the Mist Trail, which follows the Merced River up hundreds of steps to the top of Vernal Fall. This section alone keeps the Yosemite Search and Rescue Team busy each summer with injured knees and ankles. The Search and Rescue Team responds to about 100 incidents each year along the Half Dome Trail. We see a lot of situations that are caused by people slipping simply because they're not wearing appropriate footwear. And along the trail, there are several spots where the rock is guaranteed to be wet and slippery. So make sure you wear hiking shoes with good traction. Tennis shoes are not good enough. After you reach the top of Vernal Fall, the trail continues up another steep section of stairs to the top of Nevada Fall. Remember to be very careful when you're near the water. It's extremely cold and swift. The hike just to the top of Nevada Fall is already considered a long, difficult day hike. And what may surprise you is that it's not even half the distance to the top of Half Dome. Beyond the top of Nevada Fall, you'll encounter a long, sandy, hot section through Little Yosemite Valley. Each year, hikers call for ranger assistance on this part of the trail because they're dehydrated. The average person needs to drink at least a gallon of water during this hike. That equals about four one-liter bottles. A sun hat and sunscreen will also keep you more comfortable during this section of the hike. And I'd also like to point out that if you're refilling your water bottles with a water filter, the Merced River in Little Yosemite Valley is the last reliable water source. We see a lot of dehydration and exhaustion generally caused by people not eating enough food or drinking enough water. We also see people simply not being fit enough to hike the distance that they've chosen to go that day and not realizing when they start to feel poorly that the best idea is to turn around and head back down rather than push yourself to go further. As the trail climbs out of Little Yosemite Valley, you are now, finally, halfway to the top. You are also well into Yosemite's designated wilderness, where you are surrounded by the sights and sounds of the natural world. The next four miles travel up through a forest environment, and then you arrive at the subdome. Now, most visitors have heard of the half dome cables, but climbing the subdome to the base of the cables is nearly as serious as the cables themselves. The climb is similar to climbing the hundreds of steps of the mist trail, only now the steps are at 8,000 feet in elevation, where the air is thinner and the breathing can be harder. From here, the remainder of the trail is above treeline and totally exposed to the weather. If there are clouds overhead, it may be unsafe for you to continue. 
If the weather is cooperative and you continue up the subdome, you will arrive at the cables. The cables are in place from late May to early October, and they are not for the out of shape or the faint of heart. They're vertical and exposed, and surprisingly much harder to go down than they are to go up. It is extremely dangerous to use the cables during storms, even whenever it's just raining lightly. Most deaths and injuries on Half Dome have happened when the rock is wet. So check the weather before you hike. In the summer, mornings can be deceptively clear and warm, but in the afternoon, cold rain and lightning can quickly move in. It's a really good idea to bring along extra layers of clothing to keep you warm and dry on this hike. Also remember to bring along the usual supplies for any day hike, like ample food, a first aid kit, and a whistle. From the top of Half Dome, there are a few things to know about your return trip. Once you're at the top, you are only halfway done with your hike. You still need to descend 5,000 vertical feet and seven miles. So again, it's important to leave early in the morning when you start this hike and plan the timing of your return accordingly. Most of the emergency incidents that we respond to happen when people think that their day's over, they're heading back down the trail, they achieved their point that they intended to get to, and they forget to take care of themselves as they continue back to the valley floor. Everyone in your group should carry a flashlight or a headlamp with fresh batteries. On most summer nights, you can head out on the trail and find hikers without a flashlight, trying to find their way down in the dark. Don't find yourself in this predicament. I'm Maria Ortiz, and I'm a park ranger here in Yosemite National Park. Yosemite is a wonderful place to visit and a great place to camp. People have enjoyed the tradition of camping here for generations. However, getting a campsite is not as easy as you might think. I'd like to give you a brief overview of what camping is like here and how to go about getting a campsite. To begin with, Yosemite has 13 campgrounds. Four of these are open year-round and are located in Yosemite Valley, Hodgdon Meadow, and Wawona. Higher elevation campgrounds are only open for a limited time in the summer. All campsites in the park have a few things in common. They've got bear-proof food lockers, picnic tables, and fire pits with grills. Each campground also has flush or vault toilets and either running water or creek water. Creek water needs to be treated before drinking. None of the campgrounds have hookups. However, the park does have three dump stations. Perhaps the most important thing to know about camping in Yosemite is that it's very hard to get a campsite in the summer. It is also hard to get a site on the weekends in spring and fall. This is especially true for Yosemite Valley. The three car campgrounds in Yosemite Valley are reservation only, except in the winter. Reservations for these sites are made up to five months in advance and can sell out in hours or even minutes. So one key to camping in Yosemite is to plan far in advance. The other key though is to know that many of the campgrounds outside of Yosemite Valley have campsites that do not require reservations and are first come, first served. These campgrounds have the advantage of being more natural and less crowded than the ones in Yosemite Valley. While it's possible to find first-come, first-served sites at any time of year, May and June can be difficult since many of those campgrounds are still closed from snow. To get a first-come, first-served campsite, you need to show up in the morning at the campground you want to stay in. Some campgrounds are full by 8.30 a.m. during the busy season, so the earlier the better to make sure you get a site. If you're inspired to learn more about Yosemite, join a ranger-led walk. Free ranger programs are given daily, and they're a great way to make a deeper connection to Yosemite National Park. 
No matter which part of Yosemite you choose to explore, a good place to start is at a visitor center. In the valley, an exhibit hall tells the story of Yosemite's geologic past, as well as its rich natural and human history. While in the theater, the film Spirit of Yosemite presents a dramatic overview of the park. At the nearby Indian village, visitors can learn about the first people of Yosemite Valley, and exhibits and demonstrations at the Indian Cultural Museum provide a window to the past. Near the Mariposa Grove, the Wawana Hotel and Golf Course reminds us of the early years of Yosemite National Park, while the nearby Pioneer Yosemite History Center brings the past to life. A blacksmith's hammer and a horse-drawn coach transports us to the days of log cabins and covered bridges. Hey there! Are you hoping to visit Yosemite National Park during the COVID-19 pandemic? If you said yes, then great! We can't wait to welcome you. But keep listening, because reservations are required. If you're visiting just for the day and staying overnight somewhere outside the park, you need a day-use reservation. Start by going to www.recreation.gov and searching for Yosemite National Park ticketed entry. Most day use reservations become available on the first day of each month for visits starting anytime the following month. More become available two days in advance. Choose your arrival date and remember that you must arrive on that date to validate your pass. Though validated passes are good for seven days, you have to arrive on that first day and speak with a ranger at the gate. Staff will also ask for the ID of the person whose name is on the reservation. If you have a reservation to stay overnight at an in-park campground or hotel, or a reservation for lodging in Wawona, Yosemite West, or Foresta, you can show your in-park lodging reservation at the gate to enter. Remember, staff will be looking for the name of the person on your reservation. In-park campground reservations are available at www.recreation.gov. Not all campgrounds and lodges are open, so if you made your reservation before the pandemic, please visit go.nps.gov forward slash COVID for more details. Wilderness and Half Dome permit reservations will gain you entry to the park. Wilderness permits become available by lottery 24 weeks in advance. That's about six months. More become available 15 days in advance. But plan ahead. It's not possible to get a wilderness permit any fewer than nine days in advance. Half Dome permits are available by lottery two days in advance before 1 p.m. Pacific time. To apply, go to www.recreation.gov. If you have a reservation with Yosemite Area Regional Transportation System, YARTS, or with an authorized tour group, you'll be able to enter the park. Yosemite National Park works with many transportation and guiding companies, as well as partners who collectively provide visitors with access and tours of Yosemite. You can find more information about visiting during the pandemic at go.nps.gov forward slash COVID. Stay safe and have fun in the park. It's no wonder that so many visitors are drawn to Yosemite National Park. From high peaks and deep canyons to ancient forests and open meadows, the diversity of the natural world is on clear display. Making a connection to Yosemite National Park requires only one thing, your presence. Have a safe visit and help protect this special place as you experience Yosemite.